Platt here with Dr. Walter Block, of course, professor of economics at Loyola University in New Orleans, uh, but he really doesn't need an introduction. He has been in the libertarian movement and a prominent thinker in that movement for quite a while, and it's just, I mean, it's such a pleasure to talk to you, Walter. Thank you so much for coming on. You're very kind to have me. Thank you. So you're one of few people who interacted with both Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard quite a bit. And these are, you know, giants of libertarian thought. Of course, now you are uh, considered that as well. But I'm interested to know, uh, you know, what was it like to interact with Rand and Rothbard? And uh, what would you say that each of them taught you? Well, first, before I answer your question, I have to correct you. I, I think that I don't agree to put me in the same category as Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard as giants of liberty. I'm a, uh, I'm a giant follower of theirs. I would accept that. But uh, to put me in that same category, uh, these are people on Mount Olympus or I don't know where. And I'm just, uh, I don't know, trying to do my best uh, that I can to follow the, the lead that they've uh, let off. It's very okay. humble of you. Well, uh, I think it's correct. <laughs> okay, uh, let me uh, tell you how I first met Ayn Rand and then how I first met Murray Rothbard. The two are not unconnected. Uh, what happened, I was uh, a Jewish kid in Brooklyn in oh, 1950. No, it would have been 1963 or 1962, somewhere in there. And uh, all my family were pinko liberals, and everyone in Brooklyn, I think, was a pinko liberal. And I was a pinko liberal. I wasn't really interested in it, but I had no strong views of my own. I wasn't politically uh, oriented. So I, you know, uh, capitalism was evil because if you had free enterprise, babies would be starving in the street. You know, the usual stuff. And they announced that Ayn Rand, the evil Ayn Rand, was coming to Brooklyn College to lecture on capitalism. And I was ready to go and boo and hiss her because she was, you know, evil. I mean, she was a fascist. She was a monster. She uh, favored free enterprise and economic freedom. What could be worse than that, right? So there must have been maybe 3,000 kids. It was a big, big auditorium. And we all booed and hissed her at every moment that we could. <laughs> And uh, I booed in history uh, uh, along with everyone else, uh, having a grand old time uh, showing how intellectual I was. Uh, and, but then what happened is they had an announcement at the end. They said the Ayn Rand Study Club, I forget what it was called, something like that. The Ayn Rand uh, Study Club that had invited her to speak was having a luncheon in her honor. Anyone could come, even if you disagreed. And I figured, whoa, I'm going to go and boo and hiss her a little bit more up close and personal. Uh, so I did, and there was this uh, big, big table, maybe uh, uh, 50 people on a side, and Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of it, and uh, then there were 50 people on each side for about 100 people, and I was relegated to the foot of the table, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, 40 yards away from Ayn Rand, and I turned to my uh, neighbor and I said, what is this capitalism stuff? It's all evil, you know, socialism is the way to go, my usual... Uh, view at the time. I'm a little ashamed of that, but truth is true. <laughs> so he said, well, you know, I'm not really that knowledgeable about this. Um, uh, I'm sort of new to this myself, but the people who are knowledgeable are at the other end of the table. So I was a chutzpahnik, uh, pushy in those days, and uh, still am a little bit. And I went to the other end of the table and I stuck my head in between Ayn Rand's and Nathaniel Brandon's. And um, the other people sitting at the head of the table were like uh, people like Leonard Peikoff and um, Alan Greenspan. This is before he was head of the Fed. You know, the, the sort of the senior collective or the uh, senior Randy and uh, lieutenants. And I said to Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brennan, there's a socialist at the other end of the table that wants to debate someone on socialism and capitalism. And Brandon said, who, who is that? And I said, it's me. Now, remember, I was a senior in college, and you know, these people were 10, 20, 30 years older than me, so they were like adults and I was a kid. But I was pushy, as I said. And Brandon was very, very generous, very sweet, very kind. Uh, and he said, look, I'll uh, come to the other end of the table and I'll talk to you, but under two conditions. One, you promise not to let this conversation lapse with uh, just this one time, but we... Uh, keep talking about it until we settle this. And I promised to that. And then he said, you have to promise to read two books that I'll recommend. And he uh, recommended Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand and Economics and One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. 
And I said I'd read those books too. And by the way, nowadays in my uh, intro micro classes, in addition to the textbook uh, I uh, assign, I also assign these two books because if they could convert me, maybe they can convert some of my students. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Brandon came to the other end of the table and, you know, we talked and we talked and um, I probably wasn't listening because he was evil and, and all. But then I started reading these two books. I, I did uphold my promises. And I tell you, uh, Atlas Shrugged, <laughs> I just couldn't put it down. It was the most fantastic, amazing, wonderful book. It was, I don't know how many pages, 1,100, 1,200 pages of small type. And I probably read it in one weekend. I don't think I... I just couldn't put it down, except for the speech, Galt's speech toward the end, 100 pages of, I don't know. But I really loved the book, apart from that. <laughs> and I've read it every 10 years since then, and I always get more out of it each time I read it. Uh, uh, I think I'm now due, uh, pretty soon I'll be due, uh, to read it again for maybe the sixth time. And it, I just love that book. It's the best novel ever written, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there are other good novels, but that is stupendous and magnificent. And uh, there are people who criticize it. It's a stilted cardboard figures. I don't know. They, they, they just, maybe they don't have the mutation that I had uh, to be open to this sort of a thing. I don't know. So anyway, I went to Ayn Rand's house and Brandon's house in, um, in mid-Manhattan. Mid I think they were in um, somewhere near the, uh, the uh, Empire State Building in those days. And um, I was converted uh, six or seven times. I brought one of my roommates, Ben Klein, who later became a, uh, an economist at UCLA. And I went there and uh, it wasn't always Brandon and Rand. Sometimes it was Peacock. Sometimes it was um, uh, Greenspan. Uh, other people would come floating in and out. And after about five or six sessions, I was converted. I was a limited government, uh, free enterprise, libertarian. Ayn Rand never called herself a libertarian. She called herself an objectivist. And she would dismiss libertarians as hippies of the right, to put it in her accent, hippies of the right. Uh, <laughs> no one thinks I'm making fun of her. It's just that she had this Russian accent. Of and course. I, I don't mean to make fun of her, but that's how she sounded to me. Uh, the, you know, they have like a whole system, you know, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, you know, this, that, the other, A is A. And none of that ever made sense to me. The only thing that made sense to me was the free market uh, stuff that they were very, very good on. And, you know, they would uh, promote Mises' books. And, and then I would go to the NBI lectures, Nathaniel Ben Brandon Institute lectures, and these were very off-putting. Huh. Huh. Uh, what would happen during the question period, um, somebody would say something like, well, on page 462 of Atlas Shrugged, you said X, Y, Z. Could you please elaborate on that? And, oh, that would be a good question. And, you know, she would elaborate on it. But if you said anything critical, like on page 462, you said this, but on page 798, you said that, and I see an inconsistency, she would say, get out. Get huh. out? Yeah. She'd kick you right out of the auditorium. I mean that's not cool. <laughs> that, that's, sort of, that, that's sort of cultish. And uh, I didn't really like that. Uh, again, I agreed with just the economics. The rest of it made very little sense to me, but uh, I didn't really like that at all. So I wouldn't come, but then they were the only people that I knew in, in New York City or in the world that were free enterprise. So I'd sort of come back and then I'd go away and I'd come back and I, I was sort of very much on the outer skirts of the objectivist movement. I, I wasn't in the inner circle by any means because I was uh, put off by this cultish kind of behavior. And then, you know, she had these views that I now see as thick libertarianism. And uh, she would say that, um, what was it? Um, uh, uh, romantic music was good and Baroque was not good. Uh, that was her own tastes. And in other words, she was putting her own tastes as part of objectivism. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. say Rachmaninoff. Yeah. She liked Rachmaninoff. And somehow Rachmaninoff was good and Mozart was bad. Murray Rothbard later wrote a thing, Mozart was a red, which was a takeoff on this. And also she smoked cigarettes. And somehow smoking cigarettes became part of rationality. I mean, <laughs> these were the days before there, there was much of a link between cancer and cigarettes. You know, to me, it was, you know, vanilla ice cream and chocolate ice cream. It doesn't matter what you like. Do you, do you like chess? Do you like checkers? Do you smoke? Do you don't smoke? It's all irrelevant. But uh, what she was trying to do is stick in her own personal likes and dislikes. Tap dancing was good 
or ballroom dancing or whatever it was, was rational dancing. I mean, come on, give me a break. This has got nothing to do with liberty. This is just her personal tastes. And nowadays, uh, people try to input their personal tastes into libertarianism, and I'm just as much against it now as I was then. So sure, anyway, sure. I, uh, I sort of, that was my Ayn Rand period. It was sort of uh, very, very positive with the book, very positive initially uh, when I disagreed with Brandon. In other words, they were very nice to people who were on the outside. They were trying to convert. Uh, like in my first discussion with Brandon, if, if I would have said, well, capitalism sucks and socialism is the way to go, and he told me to F off, <laughs> I wouldn't have been converted. <laughs> or if he said, get out, you know. So th they were very nice to brand new people. But once you were at the NBI, you were supposed to be with it, and, and therefore you had to agree with everything they said. Come on. I mean, uh, uh, we live in a complicated world. Uh, libertarianism is a complex issue. Politics is complex. I disagree with Murray and Mises and Hayek on some things. I mean, I agree with 99.9%, .9%, but every once in a while there's an issue. And uh, Murray was never like that. Uh, you know, if you disagree with him, you, you, you're banned to the outer darkness or something. So anyway, uh, that was my Ayn Rand period you know they, they talk about the uh, the painters had a blue period or a green period <laughs> the oh, rand that period. period that was my on rand period okay so then what happened uh, i won't go into a whole history of my life but i ended up at uh, columbia university in the um graduate program in economics and there was this kid there in my class or i think it was a year behind me so maybe it was my second year larry moss and uh, Larry was also, uh, Larry was a Rothbardian. Mur Larry was a friend of um, Murray Rothbard. And based on what I said in class, he said, you must meet this guy, Murray Rothbard. And he said, Murray Rothbard is an anarchist, a free market anarchist. And I, I was still a Randian. So I was only a limited government libertarian, a minarchist. So I, I rejected to meet Murray Rothbard, genius. I'm a real genius. <laughs> didn't want to meet Murray because Murray was an anarchist. And anarchy, as we Randians all knew, I mean, I was a Randian um, uh, philosophically, even though not part of the cult. Uh, so I, um, uh, I didn't want to meet Murray Rothbard. And uh, Larry Moss had a roommate, Jerry Wallows. And one time we met on Broadway and the two of them ganged up on me and somehow uh, Jerry and Larry did what Larry couldn't do alone. And uh, I went to meet Murray Rothbard. And whoa, <laughs> was that an experience? Uh, uh, Murray was uh, this short, fat little Jewish guy who kept joking. And, and the big problem with meeting Murray and being part of his group is uh, getting stomach cramps from laughing. I mean, I would just be with him for four, five, six hours, and I'd be continually laughing. And after a while, my stomach hurt, and I had to leave the room to sort of get my uh, equilibrium back. <laughs> so, so anyway, I met Murray, and um, the way Larry Moss and, and uh, Jerry Wallows described him, I, I'd expect somebody to sort of look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and had like a rifle here and a spear here and, you know, a sponge ready to kick butt. And he was, you know, like 5'3", five, 5'4", five, and, you know, uh, a little fat Jewish guy, half bald, and um, uh, he didn't look very uh, threatening to anyone. <laughs> And he converted me into anarchism in about five minutes. <laughs> How did he do uh, that? Well, what he uh, he asked what books have I read, and I said Hazlitt's uh, Economics of One Lesson and Ayn Rand's uh, Atlas Shrugged, and he he started pulling a Hazlitt on me. Uh, pulling a Hazlitt on me was well, look, you agree that um, the post office shouldn't be run by government because. Um, uh, a competition is better than a monopoly. Uh, you, you get a better product at a lower price. And and if you have a monopoly and he screws up, uh, he still stays in business because there's no one else to turn to. Whereas if you have a competitive industry, uh, you don't like this post office, you go to another one, or you don't like this wristwatch, you go to a different wristwatch uh, place, whatever. And I said, well, why shouldn't that work for uh, police? And it would give me things like private cops are better than government cops because of this weeding out the... Uh, of the market uh, for inefficiency that um, Hazlitt would talk about. And I could see that point. And then he started talking about arbitration associations uh, instead of uh, government monopoly courts. And uh, the same thing with um, uh, soldiers and uh, military. And, and for Ayn Rand, uh, the, the idea was the government only has one uh, proper function, and that is to uh, protect persons and property uh, against aggression. And to that end, you only need three institutions, armies to keep foreign guys off of us, uh, police to keep local guys off of us, 
local bad guys off of us and uh, courts to determine who the good guys and the bad guys are in case of disputes. Sure, sure. So, Murray, maybe in five or ten minutes, I, I just saw the light, the, the light, the light bulb lit up above my head, and and I was an anarchist then. And uh, it took me like two or three years to become an Austrian economist because I had a, uh, how shall I say, an investment in neoclassical economics. I was a PhD student under Gary Becker, who recently passed away, and I fell under his sway, and, and I had a lot of investment in that sort of stuff. And uh, the idea, uh, the Austrian idea that you didn't have to, um, what is it, uh, test uh, hypotheses or test the economic laws just seems so unscientific to me. Uh, sure, that sure. it was years, maybe two or three years of reading um, Man, Economy, and State and reading um, Human Action and it finally clicked. So I was a much slower learner uh, in terms of um, uh, Austrian economics than I was of um, uh, libertarian theory. Uh, Murray, uh, I have, I could tell you stories from now until the cows come home about, you know, my experiences with Murray. Maybe I'll just spend a couple of minutes, uh, hit some of the high points. One was risk. He loved to play risk. Uh, you know, the board game risk where you take over other countries. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a great game. It's a great game. And, and what Murray would say is that only we anarchists could play it with full heart because, you know, we're against the whole thing. Whereas the statists, you know, the, the, they, they have to, you know, uh, be uh, uh, play it uh, hypocritically because it's really against their principles, you know, and uh, of governments, you know, uh, having war. And he was always saying that the defense is better. You know, the people who are defending their country are better than the people who are attacking their country. <laughs> bringing in libertarianism into risk. And uh, another problem with Murray, apart from uh, giving me stomach cramps and making me play silly games, uh, he had a very strange uh, um, time that he would wake up. He would wake up at, oh, two in the afternoon, and he'd go to sleep at five in the morning, something like that. And naturally, everyone who uh, uh, interacted with Murray sort of gravitated toward that weird... Uh, a day cycle of, of sleeping, staying up all night and sleeping all day, sort of like a bear hibernating or something. And my parents would say, you know, what are you doing? And, and, and these are the people that your parents warned you not to stay, uh, stay with because he would drink alcohol, you know, and, and for my parents drinking alcohol, you do it once a year, but you know, Murray would drink alcohol and he would stay up late all night and, I, and it was smoking aloud. And, you know, it was just a, a horrible situation from my parents' point of view. Uh, another, I guess, high point um, uh, with Murray was um, uh, he and I went somewhere. It was like the New York State Economics Association meetings, uh, and he and I drove up there, and um, he gave a, um, a speech, and I was the formal commentator, and I criticized them on some stupid thing. I forget what it was, some sort of roughly a typographical error. I think what he said was... Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Murray was attacking licensure for, for doctors and only licensure for doctors. He didn't expand it to licensure for anything. And I said, you know, um, Murray should have expanded it to licensure, period, not just for doctors. And Murray said, I accept the uh, criticism of Professor Block. <laughs> and, you know, I was like 30 years old then, and I maybe just had my PhD. And um, that was sort of a high point in, in my life that Murray accepted one of my criticisms and, you know, formal economics. Uh, I mean, this wasn't a very serious thing. He just didn't expand it enough. Uh, but, you know, obviously his heart was in the right place. Sure. Sure. Uh, you, know, you know, Rand and Rothbard had some pretty... I don't know, some, some pretty well-known fights. And I'm wondering, what do you think that they would think about the kind of infighting that we see today in libertarian circles? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the big fights between Ayn and Murray was uh, Ayn Rand was a devout atheist, uh, you know, a rabid atheist. Murray was an atheist too, as am I. But Murray wasn't rabid about this. And again, here you get into the thick and the thin libertarianism, which is a... Uh, uh, an issue of, of today, what Rand would do is define atheism as part of rationality and part of objectivism. And uh, Murray was an objectivist. He, like me, was just a libertarian. And, and as far as libertarians are concerned, uh, whether God exists or not is um, an outside issue. It, it, it's not part of libertarianism. Libertarianism just says, keep your mitts to yourself. 
don't threaten or initiate violence against innocent people. And whether you believe in God or not, you know, what's that got to do with price of beans? But uh, Joey Rothbard, Joanne Rothbard, Murray's wife, we used to call her Joey, uh, was a, a believer. Uh, she was a Christian. And uh, Ayn Rand told Murray, told Murray uh, that he should either convert her to atheism or divorce her. C can you imagine wow. Can you imagine that? And Murray, obviously, you know, uh, <laughs> Murray uh, did not took a dim view of this, and uh, that was part of the split between them. There were uh, substantive splits also on philosophy, uh, you know, the metaphysics and epistemology and ethics and etiquette and all and musical tastes and all that stuff um, uh, would be one divergence, and and occultishness would be another divergence. So. Murray and Ayn Rand uh, split. What would they think of us now? Well, I think Ayn Rand would still think of us as hippies of the right. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that we're right any more than we are left, which is a whole other issue. I think we're just libertarian and, and left wing and right wing libertarianism doesn't make any sense to me. It's either you adhere to the libertarian uh, non-aggression principle or you don't. And yet there are, uh, you see, a lot of... Um, what is it? A lot of the criticisms of thin libertarianism, of pure libertarianism, come from the left, like uh, Roderick Long and uh, uh, some guy Johnson, Charles Johnson, and a few others are saying, you know, not only does libertarianism include the non-aggression principle, but it also includes you have to embrace feminism, you have to embrace unionism, you have to embrace uh, homosexualism. Uh, you, you have to uh, not be a bigot or a prejudice or, you know, the, just a whole bunch of lefty kind of things. And but the, the point I made in one of my articles was there are also right wing uh, thickest libertarians. For example, uh, Hans Hoppe uh, said uh, to be a libertarian, you have to be a conservative. And that, this is definitely true. Yeah. And to me, that's equally uh, problematic uh, that libertarianism should be, you know, pure uh, right down the middle of the road, moderates. That's why I call myself Walter Moderate Block <laughs> when I'm feeling silly. So, um, what would they have thought of us now? I think Ayn Rand was a thick libertarian, even though she embraced the, the characteristic libertarian. She, uh, uh, how shall I say, conflated or added to the libertarian non aggression axiom a whole bunch of stuff. Mostly on the right, although it's hard to see what, what tap dancing or ballroom dancing is either left or right. I'm not sure, but it's <laughs> just her personal thing. Or, you know, you have to like Rachmaninoff and not Mozart. Uh, I don't think that's either left or right, but she was a thickster. Sure, uh, sure. Whereas, whereas Murray, you see, Murray, you could accuse Murray of, uh, you know, I, I talked about my Ayn Rand period. You could say, well, Murray had a left wing period and a right wing period, but that's not true. See, what, what Murray did, he never, to the best of my knowledge, and I might be wrong here, but I never thought he, he said, well, to be a libertarian, you have to be a lefty or, or a righty during his, uh, uh, what do you call it, neo, um, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Oh, I forget the word. Not neocon. Paleo. Uh, paleo oh, paleocon, yeah. Paleocon. Paleo-libertarian. Right. I don't think, uh, I'd have to reread it to be very sure of this, but I don't think that, that Murray said that libertarianism has to be right-wing during his paleo period or left-wing during his left-wing period, but rather what it was, look, in those days, you know, I once asked Murray, how many libertarians are there in the whole world? And I think he said something like 25. <laughs> 25 libertarians in the whole world? Uh, <laughs> so if you want to have any effect, you have to make an alliance with the lefties or the righties. So for example, you make an, a left, uh, an alliance with the lefties over the war in Vietnam. It doesn't mean you are a lefty. It just means that you and we libertarians and them the lefties were against the, the U.S. side in the war in Vietnam. Or you make a, uh, um, uh, uh, a deal or a contract or a relationship with the right wing and say, yes, we have to have gold or uh, gun rights or, or whatever the, the thing is, because we libertarians agree with the left on some things and on other things we agree with the right. So why shouldn't we? Uh, sure. this, uh, this brings me to the Peace and Freedom Party. There was this Peace and Freedom Party and um, uh, there was an anti-war group on the left and, and Murray and I remember there was Jerry Tuchili and maybe Larry Moss and, and uh, 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 Ron Hamaway, I think, and, and um, Ralph Franco and Lyndon Liggio and a few of the Murray's uh, buddies, uh, Bob Smith. And we were all part of the Peace and Freedom Party. And there were three groups 
in the Peace and Freedom Party, there were the Trotskyites who maybe had, oh, I don't know, 500 people. And then there was progressive labor, the Maoists who had maybe uh, 200 people. And we libertarians who had maybe 15 people. And for some reason, we were allied with the progressive labor, the, the Maoists. <laughs> don't ask. <laughs> uh, uh, but again, the, the whole thing was to get the U.S. out of the Vietnam War. So we would have splits and uh, the major contending parties were the two lefty groups, the Trotskyites and the progressive labor. And I, I, I'll never forget one time, remember, I was doing my dissertation on rent control. And for some reason, uh, Murray made a deal with the leader of the uh, progressive labor that we would support um, rent control and they would support the gold standard. <laughs> and... Uh, so we had a vote and you had to raise your hand if you supported rent control. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm writing my dissertation against rent control. Libertarians are against rent control. And I'm saying, Murray, Murray, can't do it. And he said, shut up, shut up. Vote for rent control. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, the good of the Vietnam War is at stake. And, and you know, I, I was sort of like a Murray groupie. And, you know, whatever Murray said, I would sort of do. The whole thing was a giggle. I mean, you know, being allied with progressive labor and the Trotskyites is alone uh, a little crazy. And uh, uh, and then Murray would say, but they're going to vote for the gold standard. And they had a hard time uh, getting their rank and file to support the gold standard. So we have the decency to support rent control. You can see why I'm, I'm, I'm dying. Even now in, in thinking about it, I'm laughing my head off. Because no, it's absolutely hysterical. This is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> so this is sort of one example of, you know, Murray just keeping me in stitches. So I, I voted for rent control. God help me. I hope my soul isn't uh, in danger from <laughs> for rent control to save the, uh, the Vietnam War. Crazy. That's amazing. So, so to get back to your question, what would they have thought of us? I think um, Ayn Rand would have supported the thick libertarians, uh, maybe not the issues, but she would have said libertarianism has to be broadened. I was just in a debate with this guy, Jan Helfeld, on um, anarchism and minarchism. He's sort of a Randian, and, and for him, you have to bring in ethics, you have to bring in uh, all sorts of stuff. And I'm just, you know, uh, with the blinders like they put on horses, just look at the non-aggression principle and deduce from that, and, and the hell with, with where you got it from. There are various theories as to where you get the non-aggression theorem, uh, but you don't have to accept everything, you know, like from A is A, and you, then you deduce down to the um, non-aggression uh, axiom. Sure. And I think Murray would have agreed with the thin libertarians, uh, uh, Lou Rockwell, uh, Bob Wenzel, who say, you know, libertarianism is just the, the non-aggression axiom, and we have no views on anything else. You're, you're free to embrace vanilla or chocolate ice cream or bigotry or anti-bigotry. But if you're a bigot, you got to keep your hands off of uh, people and property who you don't like. But you can hate the hell out of them if you want. So that would be my long meandering answer to your question. Well, uh, Walter Block, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, it's been just a pleasure to speak with you again, and I look forward to doing it in the future. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Well, you're very kind, and I enjoyed it too, and I'd be happy to be back on your show whenever. Take care. All right, and you as well. Thank you. Thank you.